read your column from earlier in the week, we were all shocked by what took place in Haiti. And then immediately the conversation becomes, well, how can Canadians help? Because there's this long-standing relationship between Canada, particularly in Quebec, and in Haiti. And you wrote that there needs to be a degree of vigilance that comes with the aid from the diaspora. What did you mean by that? Well, vigilance on many levels. The, f the first one is how the story is told. It's the words that are used in the media to describe Haiti. You know, every time um, a media report or a newspaper article mentions that Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, those, though it's true and it's a fact, I think it's important to put it into context and explain that this poverty comes because of the debt Haiti had to pay for its independence, which it finished paying in 1952 or 1953. And that's important, Natasha, because there's a, there's a prejudice that comes with poverty. And also, you know, um, you know, French economist Thomas Piketty es estimates that the reparation that France owes to Haiti is 30 billion euros. So that's about 45, mi 45 billion Canadian dollars. And so that, that puts into context why Haiti is where it is. The vigilance also, Natasha, has to come from the fact that, you know, when you have publications like the, like the Washington Post, uh, who has an editorial board, who suggests that the UN should send a muscular intervention to Haiti, I think the diaspora needs to, <laughs> needs to rise up and, and speak against that. Because in the, in the past, um, intervention by the UN has not been successful. The, the Blue Helmets brought cholera to Haiti. It killed almost 10,000 people. It, in, it, it made about 800,000 Haitians sick. Um, the Blue Helmets were accused of rape and other sexual abuse. So all these, all these facts are important and how the story is told. And the vigilance from the diaspora has to come from that as well. Okay, so that gives us a really good framework. And, you know, I've been reporting on this story all week, so it's good to have that stuff in the background. And then if we look mm. today at Haiti, two men all week had been claiming to be the country's prime minister. We know that Claude Joseph is going to stay in that spot until elections are held. How, how does the world, how does the diaspora, how do Haitians in Haiti ensure that things move forward in a progressive, democratic um, honest way? That is, uh, that is a million dollar question, I would say, because there's not one solution. solution. There are many solutions, Natasha. You know, the diaspora, it's about two million, uh, two million um, Haitians uh, around the world that are members of the diaspora. And we send back about $3 billion per year to Haiti, which represents 30% of the country's GNP. And that's important because we're not just uh, uh, bank machines. We should be able to participate a little bit more in the political uh, political life in Haiti. And so, when we speak of a prime minister right now, that has it has to be said he is contested. Um, his legit it, it does. We're putting into question if he's the legitimate person to be in place. So I'm not sure that he has the authority to ask for for foreign help like he's he's been doing in the in the past few days. And so what I think is important in the upcoming days and it's all in, in all these uh, international, if you will, not conventions, but um, international players getting together to speak of what happens next in Haiti. It's important that members of the Haitian community in Haiti and outside of Haiti are part of this, these discussions. You know, I've been working in Haiti for quite some time, and I can tell you that the country is full of smart, capable, and competent people who are able to decide what happens next. And with that, there comes a great deal of frustration that there are so many competent, bright people in Haiti, from Haiti, and yet it's always one step forward, seemingly two steps backward. You know, whether it's a natural disaster mm -hmm. or it's a health crisis, or now the assassination of the president of a country. Wh why are things not able to move forward? I, and I completely hear you about the historical context and the debt, but for so many people who wouldn't have that background, they're wondering, why, why is it so hard in Haiti versus other neighboring uh, Caribbean countries? Yes, well, I, I obviously do not have all the answers. What I can say is that in the past, international aid has failed. 
it fell after the earthquake. So sometimes people see images of Haiti today and they say, well, we sent all this money. Why aren't the buildings back up? Well, yes, maybe you send that money, but little do you know that very, very little of that money actually went into Haitian hands. And why and, is know, that? Why do you think that is, Martine? Sorry for interrupting. No, no, that's fine. Well, you know, out of, first of all, it's less than 10% of the money that was promised to Haiti that actually made it to Haiti. And of that money, it's less than 3% that went into Haitian hands. They went into lobbying groups. Uh, they went into into uh, NGOs in Washington and not even NGOs in Haiti. And that's important, Natasha, because, you know, the image that's often projected of Haiti is people that cannot that that can that can't put uh, anything together. Well, if we don't have the means, it's it's a little bit difficult. So that's part of the issues. And also, I don't want to um, wash away the fact that there are some um, decisions, governmental decisions in Haiti that were not uh, the best decisions. So we do have to take responsibility for that. But in the same token, I think that. Um, we have to remember that international aid and international intervention are two very distinct um, concepts. And I think that we have the ideas in Haiti. Um, the community has it, the doctors, the lawyers, the teachers, they know what they need to, to be doing and what, what Haiti needs is aid and not intervention.